What about the church in your house? Amen. See, what we read in all of this in Philemon and 1 Corinthians 16 and in Romans 16 were greetings that Paul would then go and he would talk to the person, he would address the person, but he also referred or referenced the church that was in their house. And y'all remember a sermon that I preached a while ago, when you come to church, bring the church. So I'm not talking strictly about a physical location because the church represents the body of Christ. So I want to talk to you today about two areas. One, the church that is in you, your house, your spiritual house, but also the church that is in your physical house. Because we tend to look at church as a place, a location, but wherever we are is church. And what we have seen here, we're going to get into Philemon in a minute, but what we see is Paul is, is showing us, because he's recording that there's several times he talks about a church that's in their house. Back before, or right after Jesus left, he gave a command. Go make disciples of all nations. Baptize them, teach them, so that they can go. Right? And what they would do is they would start churches in their homes. Most churches that are become big, somewhere along the line, they start a small. And a lot of times, if you didn't have the money for a building to pay for all the stuff, the insurance you got to pay, and all the stuff you got to pay, normally you start wherever you can. It could be in your house, it could be in my house, it could be in some location, it could be outdoors in a park, it would be, and you would hold service. So these were people that took the vision and took the commandments that God had said and began to start having church, regardless of where it was. And so one of the things I want you to see is that there's a co common denominator of all of these scriptures that we read when referencing the church in their house, but I'm talking about the church in your house, your spiritual church or your physical church. And the thing, the, the three common denominators are this. One, unless the Lord builds the house. One is God has got to be in the house. God has got to be in you. God has got to be where you go. You carry God everywhere you go. Your church is, the your part of the body is part of the church. So wherever you go, you best have God. Because when you go out and start preaching to people, that, that that maybe don't know God, don't care about God. And I'm talking about, when I say preaching, I'm talking about being a witness. You know, you just feel compelled to share the gospel. You may be compelled to talk about what the good things God has done for you. Some people might get offended. Some people might not want to hear. You might be talking to a devil and don't know it. And if you don't have God in you, You'll find yourself like those, the, 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 the men of, what is it, Skifa, yeah. where, where they went and they started talking to demons, or no, talking to people who were demon possessed, yeah. and said, I cast you out in the name of Jesus, come out. Uh -huh. And the demons rose up in them and uh -huh. said, I know Jesus, and I know Paul. <laughs> who are you? Because they saw no God in you. And so, who might have a form of godliness better make sure we have the real form of God in us. So when we go out to do whatever we're going to do, God is leading us. Amen. We have victory. Remember when we talked about this means war? Yeah. This is war. But it's only defeating the battle or winning the battle if God is in it. Amen? Amen. That's the first common denominator that all of these churches, you know what I kept saying? In the Lord. In the Lord. My fellow workers, I kept saying that because it was showing that these are people of God. Amen. But Paul is not there, so he's writing letters. And these letters are being sent to these churches, but he wants to know how is it going, not only with you, but how about the church that's in your house? Wow. We know you started because we commissioned you to go. Philemon was a runaway slave. Philemon, and if you read, it's only a chapter. It ain't going to take hard for y'all to read that. He was a runaway 
always saying that somewhere along the line he ran across Paul and got converted. Amen. And Paul said, go back. Yeah. I'm not even getting there. Uh -oh. So the first common denominator is, is God's got to be there. Uh -huh. The second one is love. Amen. You got to be motivated to do whatever you're doing for the love of God, the love of Jesus, and the love of others. This is the day we will be a blessing to God and to others. This is about us now going out. See, we're getting ready to be about it, about it. But we first got to start with where we are. Amen. The church that is in your house before we go out talking to the church that might be on the street. Amen. 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 That's the second thing. The third thing that is the common denominator in all these scriptures, they had God. They were motivated by love and they were people of faith. Yes. Faith is the thing that causes you to move and to act without knowing what's going to happen. You just believe it, you trust God, and you're going to do what God says to do. Amen? Y'all with me? Amen. So here's what we have. Jesus comes along. He's born in the flesh, but he begins his ministry at age 30. He actually began the ministry at age 30. But how many know the followers were not of the ministry? They were of the movement. Right. See, what happens is you can get a lot of people. You can get a whole bunch of folks that will get involved in the movement. Black Lives Matter. Yeah. Martin Luther King, we celebrated this not long ago. That was a movement that Martin Luther King turned into a ministry. He was all about equal rights for all. And what he wanted to do was to do it by, with what? With God, with love, and with faith. That's how you know it was a ministry. Now those who fell away after a while was not about God, was not about love, and was not about faith. It was about this is wrong, the injustice of it all. And you don't bring up your own people or bring up your own city. Because you're angry, but you don't know how to channel that anger because without God, God wouldn't say go burn up the city, especially your own stuff. Right, right, right. God wouldn't say do evil for evil. Martin Luther King was about love that neighbor. He wasn't about white, black. He was about all races. He was about equal justice, equal righteousness, equal uh, uh, equality for everybody. He began the movement, but it was all based on the ministry. It was based on the word of God. But how many know that a ministry or a movement isn't a ministry unless God is in it, unless love is in it, and unless faith is in it. And what you'll find is when Jesus came along, he fed a five thousand. Beside men and women. He fed 4,000 another time. Beside men and women. There were several times you read, you see in the Bible, and I got it written down, Matthew chapter 4, verse 23, where there was a multitude. That's more than 4,000. That's more than, he, could, he stopped counting. It was a multitude of people that came to Jesus because they wanted the healing. They needed the, the miracles of Jesus. And they got caught up in the movement. But see, here's how you know some didn't continue in the ministry. Because when Jesus left, he gave a command to continue. And what happened? Everybody scattered. There was no more God at the moment. There was no more faith at the moment. And there was no more love. It was only fear. And a depressed state of mind that we didn't get delivered. We thought he was the Messiah. Remember the people, the men on the road in Emmaus? The two men? I thought he was the one. He was the one. But he didn't do what you thought he was supposed to do because he didn't deliver you from Rome the way you thought he was going to deliver you. He was a savior. He is the savior. Let me back that up. He is the savior of the world because God so loved. He so loved. Jesus showed us how to operate by faith. That's ministry. And if we're going to be about it, about it, out there, we best have God, love, and faith. Amen. Y'all with me? 
if you look at it, when Jesus did what he did, and we take those three common denominators, and we start looking at our own church, at our own church and our own houses, if you want to know how this message came for this day, we were in the snowstorm. And we got up Sunday morning. Yvonne and I got up Sunday morning and looked out. And we had already canceled the service, but we looked out like, this is bad. This ain't me going nowhere. <laughs> and so, regardless of how long it took us to get to this point, because I don't remember whether we got up early or whether we got up, you know, 11 o'clock. I don't know. I know she was up early, but I, I probably just slept in a little bit. But I don't know. But when I got up, Something came to me, and that's where the message came. Because God says, okay, man, I know you used to go to the, you're used to, to going to the church, the location. But what about the church in your own house? Ah. That's where this came from. God says, why can't you have service right now in this house? Why can't you form a praise team, me, a young lady elect, and the Holy Ghost? Right now and 
tell her. But the way you started off is going to de determine whether her ears are going to be open or whether she's going to think, oh, he's going to be self-righteous or he's going to be trying to judge me. And the first thing I did is listen. I said, I said just like this, listen, listen. I had to stop you. I said, because I have to tell you, you know I love you. And because I love you, I got to tell you where you are. Not where your relationship is. Where what you're saying to me that I know is not God. I have to tell you because what you're saying is not what the Bible says. So, but I know this person believes the Bible, but doesn't know the Bible. And so, the first thing I did was show love and let her know I love you. And I wouldn't even say this to you if I didn't love you. If I didn't care, I'm just like, mm, yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Cast out your pearls before swine. I know, I know that. But because I love you, I got to share something with you so you don't continue down this path. Amen? So the way you, you break the ice is to show love. It is to let them know. Hey, I, look, you, you know I love you, right? Because normally when you say something like that and you stop them, they already know that what's coming behind that is probably something they don't want to hear. But because you told them that you love them and they know you love them. See, it's one thing you can say, you know that I love you, and they're like, yeah, right. But when they know you love them, they're more inclined to listen to what they have to, what you have to say. Especially when you're talking to a man of God. And you know this person knew I'm a man of God. So I'm not gonna sit there and just let you go on down a path of destruction. Chaos behind chaos and not give you the direction pointing you back to God. Okay. So that's the first thing. Second thing is Lydia, Lydia Lipton and I had a conversation. We went to visit somebody. This is the same child of God. And we sat there and this person told us about one of her loved ones. But here's the difference. This person told us that her loved one is gay. And said, but you know, we just love them through it. And I'm like, okay. I ain't saying nothing to her because I'm like, I don't know what you've said. I don't know what you've done. But I know this. You just got to sitting at the table telling us that every place you go, you can't help but tell, talk about Jesus. Wow. Every place you go, you can't, talk, you can't help but talk about the gospel. But yet when you bring up this person who is doing very, very yeah. well in the world. Yeah. Yeah. Very well in the world. Yeah. You just mention one thing and say, just pray for him. But what are you saying to him? This is somebody that's close to you. A family member. And you're not going to say anything? You can approach him just like I approach this person. And say, listen, you know how much I love you, right? Let me ask you. And, and just, do you believe this? And if they say no, then at least you know what not to do. But if they say, oh yeah, yeah. Well, then you can go to the next level. See, this church that is in your house, if you have a son or a daughter or a mother or a father that's in your house, how can you let them go a certain way when they believe in God and believe in the Bible, but maybe don't know certain things? You got to begin with the church in your house. Starting with you, and then starting with those in your house. Because if you really love them, and you know that they're not walking in the ways of God, they're going to hell. And if you love them, do you really want them to go, and you have the opportunity? Because there's nobody closer to that person than in your house. Amen. Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Y'all know this is a very familiar scripture. Jesus says, you will receive power when the Holy Ghost comes upon you. That means you will have God when you surrender to God. Because he says you'll receive power. The power is only the power of God. That's why Peter, Paul says, it's not I, but the Christ in me. I never take the glory on anything that, that I do that is effective. Remember? We will be fruitful and effective. Guess what? That fruit and that effectiveness is nothing but the power of God being channeled through us. And as it's channeled through us, how can we not allow them to use it in your
your house. Amen. Amen. In your house yeah. and in your house. Amen. You see what I'm saying? There's two. There's two. Yeah. It's you first. Yeah. Yeah. See, that's how God kind of dealt with me. He first dealt with me about being the trick that's in my house. Sunday morning, get up. You should have service. Why are you not having service? Yeah. Yeah. But then after he got that straight, he says, okay, now you can go out. Yeah. You can't go out talking to anybody and meeting them yet yourself. But now you can go out. So we deal with the church that's in us. But he says you shall receive power when the Holy Ghost comes upon you and you will be witnesses of me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. Let me tell you why he started, why Jesus started with Jerusalem. Because Jerusalem is the foundation of Christianity. Jerusalem is the foundation. Jesus, or not Jesus, this was God through the spirit of the Old Testament. Remember when he told David, David, city of David, Jerusalem. David, I will, my spirit and my name will dwell there forever in the house of David. His spiritual house and the lineage of David. Okay. It did both. Both through his genealogy, his physical, but also in the spiritual location or the physical location. That's why Jerusalem is the center and the, and, and the, and the capital of Israel. Because everybody knew that scripture that God says, my name will dwell there forever. So what he's saying is, now when you go and be a witness in Jerusalem first, he's talking about where do you live? Where's your foundation of Christianity? We know it's in Christ, but, but where? Physically, see that? The, the, the foundation of Christ is the spiritual, but where's the literal? Okay. It's where you live. If you notice, it starts in the center, then it says, then Judea, which is also in Israel, then Samaria, which is a little further out, but all of them have significance, let me tell you. Uh, Jerusalem, you already heard, is the foundation. Judea, is still part of the believers. That's the house of David, Judah. Jesus of the line of the tribe of Judah. Still go and talk, gather together with the saints. Go and fellowship. But then he says Samaria. Samaria is the unbelievers. Remember the Samaritan woman talking to Jesus? You know, why are you asking me to give you water to drink? You know, Samaritans don't have no dealings with the Jews. The Jews is of the promise. The Samaritans wasn't. Um, Samaria is represented after you've gone and fellowship, after you've gotten excited, after you went from movement to ministry, after you've gotten together with the brothers and sisters and prayer time and all those things, now he says, now you need to go out. Okay. Now as you go out, you're on fire, but you're also equipped. Okay. And when you go out, it's not a movement, it's a ministry. Amen. And because it's a ministry, you have because the power that God says you will receive, you have when you gave your life to Christ and you surrendered and you got your house in order. Amen. Once you get your house in order, God is up front. Hallelujah. When your house is not in order, God is back trying to get you to repent. Yeah, when you get to the repentance, now he says, okay, now you're able to now minister, not move, but minister to the people in your house. One of the things that blessed me was Don Don. I saw it. I saw that picture. Don Don got up and he, she sent the picture or a video. And he had a, I don't even know where he got it from. He had a, like a little mic stand. And he's standing there. And Sister Hazel said in the background of uh, something. He goes, Jesus on me. And she said, what'd you say? She said, Jesus is blessed. What'd you say, Don Jesus is Lord. Jesus bless the Lord. Jesus bless. I mean, but he was doing it. And, and he was like, just like the choir, just like the praise team. He was doing it. And I'm sitting there looking at this video going, and that's what we need to do. Children are what? A heritage from the Lord. One of the reasons that we look at churches that are dying is because the young people aren't there. If you want to know what happened to Martin Luther King's movement, all the ones that was ministry are starting to die. And the ones that don't see, we can, all of us, even if you weren't in the march, you can remember looking on TV. You can remember seeing the march, seeing the things live, and going and feeling it and being touched. But if the young folks doesn't understand that, then it's a movement. Hence, Black Lives Matter. They don't call that a ministry. They call it a movement. It's a movement. And they're angry. And rightfully so. But, do you want to turn it into a ministry? Amen. Then you got to have God. You have to have love for the one that just 
virtue, the one that just killed your brother. You have to have faith that God can turn it around. These are the things that's going to move us from movement to ministry. These are the things that is now going to have us so equipped to be about it, about it, out there. It's because we got our house in order. Amen. Okay. Amen. Amen. Let me leave you with these three things. Amen. Amen. Number one, Psalm 127, 1. Y'all already heard it. God must be in your house. Unless the Lord builds the house. They that build it labor in vain. They may, they labor in vain, they that build it. It's like it's useless to sit there and have a form of godliness. It's useless to sit there and try to go out and change anything, whether it's in you, whether it's in your house, or whether it's in the world, without God. Amen. It starts with God. It starts with our complete surrender to God. Amen? Amen? Number two, 1 John. Go with me there for a moment. I actually had this in last week when I was, uh, a couple weeks ago when I was at Pastor Woods. Uh, but it's, it's about love for others. 1 John chapter 4, verse 20 and 21. It reads this. If someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who he does not love, or for he who does not love his brother, whom he has seen, right? How can he love God whom he cannot see or, or has not seen? He said, you have to have love in your heart. You have to love the unloving. See, it, it, it goes back to Jesus. Jesus hung up on the cross and said, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. Martin Luther King sat there and taught everything. Be and not want to be hit back. He says it's going to be a peaceful demonstration. It's about loving thy neighbor. The way you overcome anything, he says, is love. The Bible says love covers a multitude of sins. Love, perfect love, casts out fear. They scattered when Jesus was hung on the cross. Why? Because of fear. Was it because of the movement or the ministry? Wow. Number two is love is the most powerful motivation to begin a conversation with. Love is the most powerful motivation. You can even say love is the most powerful instrument we have to change somebody's life. Because it's not that we love God. But it's that God first loved us. And when God first loved us and gave his only begotten son, he demonstrated love. And when he demonstrated love, we now know how to love because we've seen it in action. And now we say, so love is action. So love is when I'm going to be motivated to make a move or a decision that I don't even have control over. Amen. Once I make a decision based on love, I have no idea what the result's going to be. But guess what? That moves us to the next one. Amen. Philemon, which is faith. Faith in action. That moves God for success. Faith is the action. That's what I meant to say. Faith is the action that moves God for success. Turn with me to Philemon. We're going to end it right here pretty much. Philemon, remember where that was? Timothy, Titus, Philemon. And we're going to pick up in verse, we're going to read verses 4 to 6 and then 12 through 17. <laughs> I'm going to say chapter 1, but it's only one chapter. But Philemon, verse 4 through 6 says, I thank my God, Paul is saying, making mention of you, Philemon, always in my prayers, hearing of your love, Philemon, Philemon and your faith, which you have toward who? The Lord Jesus and toward all the saints. This is the day we will be a blessing to God and to us. Because our love for God and our love for all the saints. It don't make a difference whether I knew you or not. If you came and you declared that Jesus is Lord, you're not under a curse. Remember that scripture? For everyone who does not declare Jesus is Lord, and when I say declare Jesus is Lord, I'm talking about confessing, not professing. 
Professing is you saying it. Confessing is you believing it. Believing it will then move you from just a form of godliness to being of God or being God. Amen? Amen. That the verse 6, that the sharing of your faith may become evident by the acknowledgement of every good thing which is in you, Philemon, in Christ Jesus. Paul is saying to Philemon, look, you've demonstrated faith. You are my brother, my fellow worker in Christ. I know Onesimus, who is a slave, ran away and did the wrong thing. He says, but, well, we're going to get there. Let's get speed because that's where we're going. Verse 12. I am sending him back to Philemon. Verse 1, chapter 1. I am sending him back. Talk about Onesimus. Actually, you know what? Let's go up to verse 10. I appeal to you for my son, Onesimus, whom I have begotten while in chain, in my chains. In other words, Onesimus came to me at some point, and the Lord used me to save his soul. He has now become your brother, Philemon, as well as mine. And, and because he was under me when he got saved, he's considered my son of the Lord. So I'm going to now send him back. This is what he says. Now uh, I appeal to you for my son Onesimus, whom I have gotten while I was while in my chains, who once was unprofitable to you, but now is profitable to you and to me. Why? Because he's now a brother in Christ, which means he is also given that same responsibility that when you receive power, go and be a witness. I am sending him back. You, therefore, receive him that is my own heart. Like, the way you would treat me, Philemon, Paul is saying, treat him. Just like you would do for me, do them. I know he was your slave, but he's not your slave. But he's your slave, but he's not your slave. He's your slave when he left. And he's going to return to you as your brother. But the only way he becomes unslaved is if you release him. He says, I, I'm sending back him back. You therefore receive him. That is my own heart. Verse 13. Whom I wish to keep with me, that on your behalf, he might minister to me. Is that minister or movement? That he might minister to me in my chains for the gospel. Verse 14. But without your consent. See, he's saying, Paul is saying, look, I'm not forcing you to do this. I'm hoping and praying that you'll do the right thing. He said, but without your consent, I wanted to do nothing. That your good deed might not be by compulsion, as it were, but voluntarily. Paul, and, and he goes on, but I mean, I got to go on there because I want y'all to see this. He says, but for perhaps he departed for a while for this purpose, that you might receive him forever, no longer as a slave, but more than a slave, a beloved brother, especially to me. But look, but how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord? See, in the flesh, he's saying, look, I'm going to send him back. I know he's a slave, but treat him a little differently. You can still use him in the flesh, but now he's also got the spirit. He also has the spiritual awareness and power to be useful to you, not only in the physical, but also in the spiritual. So number three is this. Faith is the action that moves God for success. For we have no control over what's going to happen. And Paul did everything he did by what? One, God being in his life. Two, his love for all the saints, his brother Philemon as well, and his new brother Onesimus. But the third one is the key. Faith. He stepped out. He says, I'm hoping, that's what he said, I'm paraphrasing, he says, I'm hoping you will voluntarily do the right thing. Not being compulsive by my words because, oh, y'all need to read the rest of this because Paul started to talk about, because look, I can hold you accountable for a whole lot of stuff too. This is what Paul is telling Philemon if you read verse 17. Say, y'all can have me read it. If then you count me as partner, receive him as you would me. But if he has wronged you or owes anything, put that on my account. I, Paul, am writing with my own hand. I will repay. 
not to mention, here we go, not to mention to you that you owe me. Even besides my own self, or even your own self besides. Paul says, if you want to start talking about who owes somebody, yeah. if you're going to release him, I don't necessarily have to release you, but I did it because of God, because of love, and because of faith. I hope you will do it because of God, because of love, and because of faith. And when you get to that place when Jesus says, or God says, who will go for us? And we say, here I am, Lord, send me. Jesus will turn around and say, well, first, what about the church in your house? Amen. Amen. 